What's up, everyone? How you guys doing? Welcome to the show. We have John Lavia here over. Man, he's, you know, an up-and-coming interviewer, man. He is from Serious and Silliness, and he's uh, really interviewed some characters, let me tell you. We're going to be talking about his interview with a mem uh, former member of the Gambino crime family. I think this is going to be something you guys like. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> What's up, John? How you doing? Welcome on the show. Yo, thanks a lot for having me, man. It's a fucking honor to be on with you, dude. Your work is phenomenal, man. You know what? Actually, I've been watching everything that you put out, and you get a, a wide range of characters on your podcast. Yeah, I certainly do. That's that's the that's by design. That's exactly what I wanted. I did not want it to be one thing. I I actually looked at podcasts like I was like, okay, what are the best podcasts do? Like, so I looked at Rogan and I looked at Patrick, but David, which is value team. And I looked at Vlad TV and I'm like, okay, well it's a wide variety of guests. And I basically just modeled it after that. You like Joe Rogan the best. I like value team the best. I love Joe, uh, Joe Rogan's good, but I, I, I admire Patrick, but David on value team because the guy came here. He was an immigrant. He came here with his family from Iran and he, Started with nothing, and now the guy's worth. I think he's worth like 125 million or something like that. And he, uh, yeah, he started out. In he started out. In <laughs> yeah, I know. He started out in finance, and he had some. He opened some kind of finance company, and then, then he was able to open up, uh, you know, the the podcast value tainment, and he was able to put a lot of money into it. And now I think I don't know how many subscribers he's got. Two million or something like that. It's a, it's wow. a great, great show. Great show. I'm going to have to check him out. Yeah, he's uh, great. One of your recent ones that I think is going to really interest my audience was your uh, interview with an uh, ex-member of the Gambino crime family. And as you can tell, everybody, he's from the East, man. He's got that, uh, you know, accent going on, John. Uh <laughs> yeah, it ain't never going away either, man. No matter how much I try, it still goes back to that. It doesn't go away. So let's talk about the that show in particular. How did you come about going into a subject like that? Because from here in Chicago, it, it, it's kind of a shock, shock type of deal is you never have former members come on, you know, social media and stuff like that. Give their, you know, their story of what happened because out there you call it the mafia here in Chicago. We call it the syndicate or the outfit. Uh, but we were always under the impression, hey, once you're in, you're in. You ain't getting out. But now you're seeing it to where a lot of these figures are coming out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is well, that even happening that well, way? Is it changed that much? Yeah, let's face it, man. Look, it's the Italian mafia is not what it used to be. It, it isn't. It's, it's extremely weak. I actually understand that uh, friends of friends have told me that there is a no kill, an, an under, uh, an uh, out. A non-spoken law on the street, a no-kill law, because you know it just brings too much heat and so on and so forth. And and it's a it's a dying life, and there's not much money to be made anymore. I understand that guys that are fully made members even have full-time jobs because they just you know they just can't make a living doing it anymore. The things that they used to do, it's hard to get away with crime today. It, it ain't easy, you know, between surveillance and uh, advanced forensics and so on and so forth. So yeah. what happens is these guys are getting out of jail after 15, 10, 12, 15, 20 years. And they're like, well, what am I going to do? I, I can't go back to that life. There's no money to be made. I, I don't want to die in prison. Most of them turn state's evidence, so they can't go back. Right. Correct. And um, so what, what's happening is they just go, oh, fuck it, I'm going to start my own podcast. People all over the country and the world love hearing it. So for me, it was it was actually relatively easy to break into it because I'm from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. And that was, was at one point an all Italian neighborhood plagued with mafia. I mean, Sammy, the bull Gravano's from that neighborhood. So many, uh, bank gangsters are from that neighborhood. 
my my parents grew up in Red Hook. When they were there, it was all Italian. Now it's one side is all black and Hispanic. The other side is all uh, hipsters, yuppies. Now it's completely different. But that neighborhood was all gangsters and so on and so forth. <laughs> so what happened was, I I since I was from the neighborhood, I I reached out to somebody who came out of prison and he was on Value Tainment and he was on Vlad TV, and he was from Bensonhurst and I, that that's Larry Mazza. He was a made member of the Colombo crime family. He was in the thick of things when they had the war, when it split up and the war between the family of the Columbos. And he was on uh, the Persico faction. And then there was the Vicarina faction. And uh, he, just because I was in the neighbor from the neighborhood, he goes, absolutely. I'll come on. No problem. When do you want to come on? And he's been on like three times. And it's just because he has that old school value where if you're from the neighborhood, I take care of people from the neighborhood, which is dead today. It's, un- it's unfortunate, but it's true. And we had a great interview. And because of him, I was able to get other guys. I was able to get a, a friend of his that was also in the, with the Columbos, Frankie Steele. And the one that you're talking about now is Anthony Ruggiano Jr., who was on Vlad TV. And I, I was able to get him because after that, I was able to just make contacts. You know, I had before Anthony Ruggiano, I had Rita Gigante, whose father was... Vinny the Chin Gigante. I don't know if you remember him. He was mm-hmm. from Greenwich Village. He was the guy that used to walk around and pretend that he was paranoid schizophrenic in a robe and he would talk to a tree. Meanwhile, he was like the most pop, the most powerful crime member in like possibly the world. He headed the Genovese crime family. He was on the commission during the 70s into the 90s. And mm-hmm. uh, I had her on, which was a tremendous interview. And then I was able to get Anthony on. Um, and the thing with Anthony is he's such a nice dude. Like, he's such a nice guy. You're like, this guy really was a mafia dude? Like, he was really a killer? And it was like, because when you, when you interview, when I inter- when you interview Larry and when you interview Frankie Steele, and I had Anthony Couchy on too, but he was from Florida. And I was on John A. Light's podcast. He wasn't on mine. I was on his. And you, and you talk to them and you, you're like, okay, yeah. You could, you could kind of tell they have that, like Larry Mazza, John A. Light, like they have that businessman camouflage. But you could tell inside there's there's a monster, right? Mm. Um, where Anthony is like, he's not like that at all. Like he's like a real nice dude. Every he's so calm and chill. The thing was, his father was Fat Andy, who was a captain in the Gambino crime family, and he kind of he was like kind of Michael Corleone. In he was in the family, and originally he didn't they didn't want him to be, and he just kind of went with the with the family, and and he wanted, and he was never he was actually never made. He was never a made member, fully made member. Wow. Yeah. Well, you say you're from uh, Bensonhurst, mm-hmm. and you said how everything has changed. Now, oh. I know how that feels where I grew up in Chicago and stuff like that. I always said it was uh, the uh, the forever uh, bother Italians that ki- you know killed the neighborhoods, yeah. the FBI and stuff like that. Uh, I thought with the boys, it was always – the neighborhood was always safer. You didn't have all the crap happening on the street corners that they wouldn't allow it. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting what you just said about your neighbor. You know, before we got on the show, Mm -hmm. your neighborhoods changed a whole bunch. Yes. How was it taking out the people that protected the neighborhood Compared to it is now, how is you know how is that to you? The old, the neighborhood that I I grew up in, it's right now is relatively safe. Now, it, it's kind of mixed, all right. So the the truth of the matter is, when I lived there, I'm 46, and I lived there. You know, I was born in 76, so I lived there in the 80s through the 90s. Then we had moved to Staten Island, but my father, my brothers were a lot older than me, so on and so forth. There was still crime in the neighborhood. But it was conducted by the by the boys, for the most part. I mean, you you always had like the you know the the punks, the, you know the, the the wannabes or the the young kids coming up. But the protecting of the community was there. So the protecting of women was there. The protecting of children was there. But listen, you know, my father had a a Mercedes Benz, and you know he had to rent out a garage because we he didn't have a, a garage back then. And if he didn't rent out a garage, he would, the emblem would be missing, the bumper would be gone, the radio would be gone. And then, oh, yeah. and then he would send my brother up the corner on 20th Avenue and go, go, go get another radio. And he wouldn't go to like Sam Goody. He would go get 
a radio from the, the corner, like the kids that he was probably buying the same thing back. Right. <laughs> right. And, I, and so today, generally speaking, the neighborhood is safer just from surveillance, from, from advanced forensics. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's a very quiet neighborhood. Some Italian neighborhoods became, you know, uh, more inner city, more um, African-American, more Hispanic. The one I can it became more Asian, more Chinese. Like if you go down, you know, 20th Avenue, 18th Avenue, 86th Street, there's a lot of stores and storefronts that are Asian and you can see the Asian letters. And, and that community is relatively very um, to themselves and supportive of themselves and so on and so forth. And there's not much crime that goes on. Uh, so the neighborhood itself really isn't that, uh, that has, has a lot of crime, but that's in general, that's New York city. Like I work in Harlem, right? Uh, wow. my, I'm, yeah. I'm a sewer worker in Harlem. I could, I go to, to lunch. We've gone out after work. Like it's not necessarily now don't get me wrong since COVID and you know, the Democrats that are in, that are in power, you know, yeah. uh, they, <laughs> They're, 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 in the last few years, they've been easy on crime, and it's, it's it's going up. It's going up. But when you talk about the seventies and eighties, uh, you know, it was it was fucking bad. Mm. But but it was bad. But I feel like it was bad all over. But the but the guys in the neighborhood, the community, they protected the community. You know, Sammy the Bull. I think I told you this story on the when you were on my show. Sammy the Bull had a, a club on eight, I want to say Eighteenth Avenue. I'm pretty sure. And uh, in one of his interviews, the girl, he told me, he said the girls in the neighborhood would always walk on his side of the street because they knew it would be safer. You know, they knew nobody would do anything, you know. Um, God forbid, uh, you know, a kid uh, came out or a kid got hurt or, uh, you know, a girl got hurt. I mean, you know, it, they, they were going to take care of business. You know, that's just the way it was. You know, our first question comes in for you, John. Uh, like I said, you guys. Uh, China put his uh, channel in the comments uh, uh, section, Serious and Silliness, right here on YouTube, and it's also on the podcast platforms. Is there a question that you should never ask someone in the Italian crime family? Well, I, no matter who I interview, well, let me rephrase that. If somebody comes on and doesn't want to get paid, I give them the respect enough, as I did to you, Mm. Is there anything you don't want me to ask you? And if there is anything I ask that I that you don't want to answer, you just say skip it. I don't want to answer that, and I'll edit it out or whatever. So the same thing. But the thing is, with the if you're you can't get tried for the same case twice. So if they did time for whatever murders or what racketeering or 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 gambling or whatever the case may be, prostitution, whatever they had their fingers in, they they'll talk about it. And as long as they'll talk about it, I'll ask about it. But if they come on, like with Anthony, Anthony, I didn't ask him that because it was more of a business transaction. But um, no, not anymore. Basically, no, not anymore. Unless there was, like I said, unless there was something they explicitly tell me. I mean, I've had Larry Mazzarano. We've talked about the commission. We talked about um, the bosses. I, we've talked about Rita Gigante came on and told me it was the, she said, you know, her father should have gotten an Oscar, that it was the biggest act you know, in that ever happened when he used to, her father used to pretend to be paranoid schizophrenic, you know? And mm. uh, so, no, not so much anymore. But, you know, if they say I don't want to answer that, I just skip it. I give them all the respect, you know? And But usually most of the time beforehand, I'll just uh, say that. Look, look, I hate to say it, man. I mean, I'm Italian and there was, there was some pride in the fact that there was this secretive, uh, there was this secret society that an Italian person could go to for help. You know, and, and that happened a lot, you know, I mean, it happened to my father plenty of times where he got involved with people indirectly and then he had to go seek help and say, look, you know, this is happening to me. I need help from you guys. And they would help him. The problem is that they, he was always on the string after that, but they would step up and it'd be like, OK, we'll take care of it. And it happened all the time. That's gone. Mm. That's that's gone. That's it. All you right. know. How do you think uh, Sammy's conducting his podcast? I don't know if you've seen it or heard it. Sure, sure. Uh, Sammy's a look. Sammy's a gangster through and through. That's it. I mean, some some of the guys you could you could look you could listen to, and he's a gangster through and through. Um, the only thing is, you know, there's only so many stories you could tell. It's starting to get redundant. You know, I used to listen to him all the time, and I was kind of saying the same stories over and over again. 
you know, um, but it's still fascinating for, for most of the people around the country that didn't grow up in neighborhoods like you or me because they just don't don't know it. Um, but now it's getting to the point where like the bottom of the barrel of the guys are coming out of the woodwork that want to go on podcasts and get paid and so on and so forth. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, dude, I like, you know, and that's why, I, that's why I keep my channel so diverse. So if, if one thing goes out of fashion and nobody wants to watch that anymore, you know, I just move on to the, the next topic, you know, and that's the whole, I, I, that was the whole idea. Awesome podcast, man. Thank I you, man. love your interview style. Your interview you get into the questions and the meat of a subject with that person. And that's what I really like about the channel. There's YouTubers out there. There's con, uh, con, uh, Kent, uh, creators, and they don't get like that. You know, it's just, okay, what do you want to talk about you? You get into the meat of it. Thank you so much, man. The, this, uh, you know, it takes, it takes some time. I've been doing it for about two and a half years. But it takes some time. If you go to my early stuff, my early, my first interview, one of my first interviews, and it was actually because I knew him, was um, DMC from Run DMC. Mm -hmm. And if you watch it, you go back and watch it, I really don't say much. I got lucky where I, I made some questions, but he, the guy just doesn't stop talking. So, like, literally, he would just keep talking, and I, and I would just, you know, it turned out to be good, but I didn't have to do much work to put into it. And But then you run across people that, you know, Want to do an interview, but they're, sh they're sh you know they're one word answers, and you got to pull it. You got to pull it from. Them. Yeah, you, it's like pulling teeth. But the whole idea, the whole again, like when you watch uh, a value tainment, mostly value tainment, or even Rogan, Vlad, Vlad TV too. But sometimes he tries to get under your skin to get a, an emotional reaction out of you. But for the most part, Vlad TV too. It's the idea of being respectful to the to the in the uh, um, the guest, giving him a lot of respect. And when you and 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 letting them feel, making them feel comfortable. And if you give them respect and make them feel comfortable, they are going to answer the question because they feel comfortable. Once they go on the defense, it's it's very difficult to get a good interview. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very because and, and and plus I don't like interviews like that. Like I get angry at the interview. I'm not here to listen to you, and I know the people aren't here to listen to me. They're here to see the guests, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then believe me, sometimes I lose myself. Like we, I get to a topic and I start talking too much and I got to, oh, this isn't about me. I got to get back on track with that, with the person. And I hate, like, I don't know if you saw the interview of, of Andrew Tate when he was on, oh, what's the guy's name? The British guy. I forgot his name. Um, I, I forgot the guy's name. Whatever. Pierce Morgan? Yeah, right. Morgan Pierce. Yeah. And I fucking hated it because the guy just was just on the, on the offense going after Tate the whole time. It's like, dude. Let the guy finish a sentence, kept cutting him off. And I was like, why would anybody watch that? We're not here to watch you, uh, uh, Pierce. We're here to watch the guest, which is Tate. Mm -hmm. you know? And I never liked that. And, and just to prove my point, when Tate was on uh, Value Tame with Patrick but David, it was a three-hour interview because Tate was so comfortable with him and I, his co-host that they just let him ramble on. And he was telling stories left and right and talking about how he made his money and you know, what he, what he, uh, what, uh, you know, what happened when he got, uh, uh, censored and so on and so forth. And it was a great, it was a great interview. I actually watched, oh, it was three hours. So I watched like half of it, you know? And so that's what I model myself as. Tommy his channel is serious and silliness. It's right here on YouTube. Uh, China Dow's trying to find, uh, his link right now. Oh, thank you. Uh, China, do they still have the same respect now as they did back then? I know in Chicago. Uh, see, it's a little different in Chicago because you guys have, what, five out there? Yeah, here it, was, it was five. Oh, yeah. Nasty here, man. Yeah, it was It was always – New York was always the, the, the city that ran the whole country, right? It was five families. It was started by – everybody knows the story. It was started by Lucky Luciano, and they, they modeled it after a corporate – model right where there was somebody at the top and on the boss a counselor and then they would have the bosses and you know the so foot soldiers and they were always like uh basically for the most part would put in charge of the guy the guys in new york or the guys in philadelphia or the guys in florida uh uh so on and so forth well, that was another good one i had this girl that worked directly for santo traficante in florida that was a good one her name is joey oh. joey gallo yeah this woman who used Joey to, Gallo. <laughs> yeah, Joanne Gallo. They called her Joey Miami. 
She's got to be in her 70s now. And in this 1970s and 80s, she worked directly for Santo Traficante. And if anybody who doesn't know that, Santo Traficante was one of the most powerful crime bosses in the country, possibly in the world. He sat on the commission when, the, when it was like a big deal, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And she had, there was like, she actually worked as a, a liaison between him and uh, Noriega because they would do business together. Right. And uh, it was a tremendous, That's tremendous. Panama guys and gals, yes. so you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? what I would have to say the biggest legend in my eyes was Tony Accardo. You know, they used to uh, say he had more brains at breakfast than Al Capone had all day. And he was like uh, literally the godfather of Chicago. And he never, you know, never spent a day in jail because that's just how smart the guy was. Yeah. So Chicago, we have different uh, ways of looking at stuff. It's always funny. There's still that Chicago, New York feud that goes on. Yeah. You know, as far as who's better this, who's better that, who's pizzas, who's hot dogs. Who's baseball team, who's football. Who's, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, moving on a little bit, man, uh, after uh, the mobsters are like one percenters, if you don't know them, best to let them alone. Don't rattle those cages. No, I don't I don't agree at all. The one percenters are definitely still strong, still uh, secret. You definitely do not want to mess with one percenters. There's nothing left. Like I wouldn't even I'm in Jersey. I wouldn't even know where to go if I had to seek help. Mm. Right. I, like like it, it's just. They, and, and and from what I understand, there's an unspoken rule on the street now. There's like a no kill law because they, they get they get tailed so much and they get watched so much. And it's not like the movies, man. You know, like I, I watched this one interview with uh oh god, this one guy from Staten Island, big dude, he was on Vlad TV. I forgot his name. Whatever, it was a great interview. And he wore a wire, but in the movies, it's like a wire with this fucking pack. He goes, you can't even find it. It's as big as your pinky nail. Like you can put it under your ear. It, it, you know, it's not like it is in the movies, and right, yeah. So it's now, nah, man. It ain't the same. I mean, do we? Are there still? Is there? I don't think it, there's always an element out there, but it ain't the same. It's not, well, when the Italians went went down, and it's you know kind of sad. Now you got the Russians in yeah. there. You got the you got some nasty people in there now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would not want to mess with the Eastern Euro- European, Ukrainians, Chechnyans, Russia. Definitely, those are the people I would not want to mess with. No, and I think but, they're more sophisticated as far as crime goes, too. Right. Moving into some fun stuff here, you've had a couple porn stars on your <laughs> show. Yeah, they're the best. I was like, wow, man, you got to tell them some stories from these guests. Yeah, so I've had on Sarah J, Alexis Golden. I had on uh, Brooklyn Spring Valley, who was like a new girl coming up. I had on uh, Nikki Jackson, who well, we still remain friendly, her and I. We kind of like uh, hit it off. And then the, the newest one was uh, Brandy May. And uh, Brandy May was the newest one, and she's more of a fetish porno chick. And so was Nikki Jackson, but especially Brandy May was more into the fetish, the muscle worship. And some of the stories that she told me, and Sarah J too, like some of the stories were just unbelievable. Like I, I asked uh, Nikki, uh, not I'm sorry, not Nikki Jackson. I asked uh, Brandy May, you know, what's the line? What line w- w- that you won't cross? And she goes, you know, when do you say no? I'm not doing that. And she goes, extreme bondage. And I was like, what is extreme bondage? She goes, that's when you know I get tied up to like a a, a, a pole or a or a post or something like that. And I'm just tortured for 45 minutes with like chains and whips and dildos and guys sticking things in me and for like 45 minutes and whipping me. She goes, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, Oh, thanks. I'm glad <laughs> you wouldn't do it. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I said, so, and what's funny is I interviewed Nikki Jackson and there was an, Another girl I interviewed, her name was Alicia Young. But Alicia Young is actually a champion bodybuilder. But women bodybuilders are such a niche that they either have a job or they have a career of their own or they're doing the muscle worship thing because it's not – they're not getting paid much money. There's not – you know, in bodybuilding, there's not much money for for women bodybuilders. You know, and there's not much sponsors for them either because most girls don't want to look like that, right? So it's very difficult to get them real, real paid sponsors. So they either – They either embrace the muscle worship thing and do this fetish stuff or they actually have their own career. So Alicia Young, you know, is like a a model like she she's actually beautiful. Like she has a lot of muscle, but her face is beautiful. She has this long blonde hair. She has these giant boobs. And um, I asked her 
what was the line? And she said, I just can't, I can't burp or fart on somebody like that. <laughs> guy, guys want me to burp or fart on them or, uh, or just get paid to fart and then video it and send it to them. And then I asked that to Brandy May. I was like, I told her and she was, Oh, I fought it so much time. She was, I fought it on guys. And, and then she told me the secret. Did you see that part? Where she said, you get, you know, like a nasal spray thing, but it's empty. Uh huh. And it's just air and you shove it up your ass and you, and you put air in your ass. And this way you'll have like air to blow out. And it sounds like a fart, you know? <laughs> so she's able to fart on command by, by, by shoving air up her ass, you know? Um, Personally, I thought as far as the porn ones are concerned, the best interview was Sarah J because she was so honest and she's been in the world for so long. Now, when I asked her, I asked her what was the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to her, she told me this story where she was she had a contract where she was um, shooting uh, porn live. And um, and it was in I think she was in Budapest or some kind. I think it was Budapest. I'm not 100 percent sure. And it was shooting it live. Right. And it's her, another guy and another girl. And she's her and the girl are 69 and she's on top. The guy is standing behind Sarah J and he's giving it to her from the back. And she's on top of this girl. And out of nowhere, Sarah J has her period all over this girl's face. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's live. <laughs> like they can't do anything about it. So the like the camera guy just like, she told me the camera guy just pans to like a, a corner when nothing's going on. And then they jump up and she's like trying to help the girl clean off. And the girl's like, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. You know, and they're like cleaning her up and everything. And I'm like, oh my God. Like I almost lost my lunch when she was telling me that story, you know? Yeah. But, but what the freaky thing is you have freaks out there that like that kind of stuff. Love it. It's un. I've never, it was like, I've done stuff where I thought that I was disgusting and I was embarrassed of. And then when you open up Pandora's box and you see what I'm, it's nothing. I'm normal. I'm not even close. We're like conservative. It, <laughs> it's like, you know, like, it, uh, you know, my wife was, uh, there've been times where I was like, let's try this. And my wife's like, I'm not doing that. What the hell is wrong with you? And then I, I see these, you know, these interviews that I do and what these guys like. And I'm like, this is not, nothing what I want to do compared to what these guys want. I mean, so, so there was, uh, the, I interviewed Nikki Jackson and she does a lot of ball busting Right. And uh, so basically ball busting is getting kicked or punched in the nuts. Right. Oh. And a guy pays her to do it. But she goes, you know, it's not as easy as it seems. So I was like, what? What do you mean? She goes, well, you know, when you're seeing the final product and the editing, she goes, first of all, I'm, I'm in heels and, you know, I have to balance myself on one heel and kick the guy in the balls with one heel. She goes, there are times I fell over. She goes, I sprained my ankle one time. And then she goes, there are times I miss and I hit him like in the taint. Or the or the the gooch, whatever you want to call it, or I hit him in the knee, and it just it's just horrible. And she goes, so it it's it takes a few takes before I actually get it right. And I'm like, I didn't even thought of it, you know. But but she goes, and I'm like, here this guy is getting his freaking balls knocked out. Oh, dude, and it's like it's like you know he just and she told me it's like he just wants more and more. So he just keep going. And it's like Jesus Christ. Like if you guys are just joining us, this is John from Serious and Silliness, uh, China Doll, or any of the moderators can put that in uh, the live uh, chat room for him. Let's get over there, subscribe to him. Uh, oh hell no, gross. Uh, you know what? Me and China Doll on our uh, show. You know, we get into some weird stuff. We're kind of like you on the second part of it because we got our biker news first, then go into the second segment. And I really enjoy the second se segment because we're not in that box where we can go outside the box and start talking about all kinds of uh, subjects out there. And that really is, you know what, you're on to something where that is a draw where people just don't want to see the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, you've had gangsters on, you've had porn stars on. Uh, yeah. Now, I can't get that out of my head now. That had a period, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I got to tell you one other story that was even more disgusting than that. So uh, I asked Sarah J, um, what was the strangest fetish that you ever were involved in? And she said, well, it wasn't in... in in my work, it was actually in my private life. So I was like, all right, you know, go ahead, tell me. So basically she had this friend, this guy, 
it was like, you know, a fuck friend. They would just hang out, maybe go to dinner, get some drinks, or then they would just have sex and so on and so forth, right? So uh, she goes over his house one time and she goes, um, uh, he goes, oh, I want you to do something for me. So she goes, what? And he goes, I've been saving my sperm in a cup in the refrigerator and I want you to feed it to me. And what? When, yeah, I swear to God. And when he, she said that, I literally dry heaved. And if you watch it, if you go back and watch it, you can actually see me almost dry heaving when she told me that. And I said, did you do it? She goes, yeah, I did it. I was like, oh, oh, my God, dude. Yeah. yeah. So many women I really do feel sorry for, man, the stuff that they got to put up with women. Oh, yeah. But you know what? I, when they embrace it, like. Like when I when I spoke to Sarah J and and uh, Brandy May and Nikki Jackson, you know these girls are are are, are our age. You know they're all over thirty five. I mean they still look good because they're this their job. They have to look good, so they have to stay in shape. You know, and they have to you know whatever get the breast implants or butt in whatever the hell they do. But they embrace it, and the ones that embrace it give you the most honest um, interviews. So like you know there are porn there are porn chicks out there that play the victim. I forgot the girl's name. I don't remember. I forgot the girl's name. And she has her own podcast now. And she's on there like crying like I did this and I can't believe I did that. And and she's literally crying and playing the victim. It's like, well, dude, dude, nobody put a gun to your head. But he said you had to do it. You signed up for this. Like, and you and got you, paid. And you got paid. And you wouldn't even you wouldn't have your own podcast with this much of a following if you didn't do that shit to begin with. Nobody would care who you are. You know, I, I forgot. I forgot the girl's name. I don't remember. Oh, uh, Ro- Alana Rhodes. That's it. Rhodes. Alana Rhodes. Oh, she broke down. I think a couple of times talking about her. It's like if that's you know, that what's interesting is they do the ones you did uh, interview. The age isn't there a shelf life for a porn star? Not anymore. Like they used to be. Like when when porn was first like on the big screen, and uh, that's actually what I asked Alexis Golden and Sarah J. Um, there is a there is a, a thing for young girls, you know. They want the young girls to eighteen, nineteen. But if that's when that's the case, if you're you know you get into your late twenties, early thirties, you go into the milf category or the gilf category when you get older, which is the grandmothers. I'd love to fuck. Um, mm-hmm. You you go into the interracial stuff. You can go into the fetish stuff. You can go into the big boob stuff. You know, and the internet has basically given these girls. A wide range of ways to make a living now where yeah back in the day like in the 70s 80s and 90s it would be like um yeah if they're younger you are the the the, the uh, more they want you you know but well, um, you, it, you know they have all kinds of avenues now only fans is huge for women huge 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 and they don't you know i'm not a look I, do what you want right i really don't care don't get me wrong right i, I really don't care but OnlyFans is OnlyFans and webcamming is the uh, the door into that world. You know, when we were when we were young, if you wanted to break into the if a girl wanted to break into the adult entertainment world, you know, you became a stripper, you moved to LA, you moved to Vegas, and then you know somebody would notice you and and then right and that was like the doorway into that. Right now, it's OnlyFans. And all these young girls are doing OnlyFans because they think they, they can make a quick buck. And they think they actually discovered fire. And it's like, you know, you're not doing anything special. You're just doing it at home on your laptop. And then, and then what happens is it's the slippery slope. You know, oh, I could charge $10 a month to show my boobs, right? But if I, you know, if I do some masturbation stuff, oh, I could charge, you know, $15 a month. And, right, and then the slippery slope happens, and before, and then every time you you move the the goalpost, it's justification for the next thing. Like, well, I already did masturbation; I could do, you know, masturbation with another girl. Well, I already did that, or so I could do like a full blown sex scene with another guy. I already did that, so I could do two guys, and it just becomes like you just lead down this road of of just debauchery. Just, yeah, basically, and it's to me, I don't, I don't, and it's it's more girls than you think. You know, it's more girls than you think because it's it's today it's looked at as like women power and you know don't judge me and no slut shaming and it's like you 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 dis- you're destroying yourself. What kind of life are you gonna have when you're forty, fifty? You're gonna be alone. You know, mm. you get knocked up. You have no man. Hopefully, and we know this to be true that most of them aren't good with money. They just spend. You know, they're not gonna 
invest. I mean, some of them have. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like Sarah J is very wealthy. We even talked about her production studio and she actually uh, directs and produces and her own website and so on and so forth. But the majority of girls are just kind of piss it away, you know. Mm. And, and I don't think it's a good lifestyle. At the same time, it seemed like a hypocrite because I bring them on the show. But the truth is, this is what people want to see. And if this is what people want to see, this is what I'm going to fucking give them. Well, we got a big announcement coming from John. Uh, but first, Hollywood, please have him say how you doing. I got to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I just got you doing. <laughs> <laughs> I even I even text it like that. <laughs> like I even text it like with a Y-A, a D-O-I-N. How you doing? I even text it like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have a huge announcement right now. John, go for it. It's your platform. Oh, thanks a lot, man. So one of the things that I've always loved was bodybuilding. I used to compete. You could see the trophies back behind me, uh, but I was never good enough to um, to go pro or anything like that. I never had the size. I was never big enough to go pro. And, and every generation, these guys get bigger and bigger. But one thing that I did on my show is I would interview a lot of bodybuilders. And I started maybe six months ago, I started doing kind of like this roundtable discussion where I got pro bodybuilders to come on and talk. And, and that seems to be the that seems to be like the model that a lot of the larger bodybuilding platforms are doing. So anyway, I did one on this week, that week, this week that passed, it came out on Thursday. And I had a whole bunch of uh, bodybuilders on. I had about four pro, pro bodybuilders, but one guy, his name is Nick Walker. And uh, if you guys ever see what he looks like, he's just, he's a freak of nature. He's, you know, it's- Does he it's, make uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Lou Ferrigno look like- uh, Yeah, the new guys today make the old guys look like nothing. I mean, they look like nothing. It's almost, it's, uh, you, 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 but Nick Walker has this huge personality and he had this, con uh, he had this contract with Hostel Supplements and Hostel Supplements also has a podcast. So he was only able to go on that podcast under his contract, but they had a falling out and they split up. Anyway, long story short, I was able to get him on my podcast and do the, the round table discussion. I called a bodybuilding tour. Well, anyway, it caught the eye of this guy, Ron Harris, who runs muscular development online. And for people who don't follow bodybuilding, muscular development to bodybuilding is like vogue to fashion. It is like the number one platform that cover all the pro shows. They ha have interviews. They have like, I don't know, 350,000 subscribers. They've been around forever. It used to be a magazine. And then they went, you know, then they had a, a website when, it, when it's changed. And now they have this huge podcast. Anyway, they offered me to do that show on their platform. So this is like huge for me. They actually, uh, Ron contacted me on Instagram and asked me and we talked about it. And actually the first show comes up this, this week. I got, I'm doing it Wednesday and I already got the guys put together and it'll be out Thursday on muscular development. And you know, like you got to be into body. If you're into bodybuilding, muscular development is like, like it's like the Harley Davidson for body. It's like huge. It's not like this little shitty, you know? And uh, so it's going to give me a lot of exposure. And uh, beautiful, th man. Th th thank you so it's much, amazing. man. Thanks it's a lot, brother. Now, you know what is interesting? See, you're from Brooklyn and stuff. You're around, you're you know, three years younger than I was. Mm -hmm. Boxing was everything to me, oh, me too. Now, this MMA stuff and the way these guys are coming out with the, the physique that they have mm -hmm. is you know, they how can I say it? They freaking mix the MMA with the body building now. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Insane. Every generation. And I don't care what anybody says. You always have the older generation that shits on the new one, but I don't care what anybody says. Every generation, the athletes get better and better and better because you know, the diet gets better. Science gets better. Exercise science gets bigger, better. They know how to work out. You know, it just gets, it just gets better and better with every, with every generation. I mean, like I said, you know, my father thought Rocky Marciano was the greatest fighter in, in the world, right? Damn right? You know, yeah, yeah, you know, well, <laughs> you know, but the guy, you know, like, you know, he was 185 pounds and he was the heavyweight champion, you know. But, um, Babe yeah. Ruth uh, was right. the best too. <laughs> yeah, he was a fat drunk and he was the best in the world, right? So, but t today, these guys, and the same thing's happening with MMA and a little bit with boxing. Boxing's kind of dead. It's um, kind of a dead sport. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they do a lot of weight training. Uh, from what I understand, the UFC tests very hard for uh, uh, performance enhancement drugs, anabolic steroids. 
But there, there are guys that slipped. There was one guy recently, I think last year, that uh, got um, suspended because they blood tested and they found anabolic steroids in, in him and so on and so forth. But there was, there's other ones. There's other MMA uh, federations, if you will, that don't test. And, and these guys are fucking jacked, you know? Mm. And I don't care what anybody says, man. That, that stuff gives you an edge, you know? And if you are in a competitive sport and somebody else is going to take that edge, you're going to take it. You know, mm-hmm. and these guys, these guys, yeah, these guys come in shape. I mean, they're chiseled. I mean, you know, some of them, you know, they don't look it, but most of the guys, and even the girls, even the girls look like they look like athletes. You mm-hmm. know, you know, it's just unbelievable how they come in. You know, and it's, I don't know, man. So where are you going to be taking your show, uh, serious and uh, silliness? Where are you taking it to? Where well, do you want to be? Well, I definitely wanted to continue to uh, do more interviews. So I'm trying to – I had uh, Forrest Griffin on, the former light heavyweight UFC champion. I'm trying to get more UFC guys on. Um, definitely um, going to do more more one-on-one interviews on my platform because the like the roundtable discussion for bodybuilding is going to be on muscular development. And I'm hoping in three to five years or so, you know, I'll be making money where I could have a studio like yours, you know, um, and, you know, go from there. You know, I do the news with a friend of mine that it's really funny. And it, we, we talk about these crazy things that happen. And it's just really funny. There's a guy I knew when, when we were kids. And then we used to work together. And then um, and then we just hooked up. And he does, you know, he's like the comic relief. It's hilarious. So that's basically what I'm, I'm trying to get to. I'm gonna, trying to get to the point where I can have a nice studio and and, and and make a make a living doing this, even though I have my own career. I'm a sewer worker in New York City, and that's the whole idea. And it's 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 on its way because I'm breaking I'm breaking I'm breaking doors down. Like I said, muscular development found out my you know uh, even like doing interviews like you helping me out. I mean, what's funny is like the guys that help me that go up above and beyond are the it are guys that are like federally convicted fucking criminals that have to know what it's like to, to be at the bottom of the barrel and they and they look to help people mm-hmm. and um i mean you know danny delo um I, you know came on my show larry mazza uh you know um rita gigante uh you go you go down the down the list of people you know anthony couchy you know anthony we couchy get Mooch on your program who mooch he's uh He'll actually be on the program tomorrow with me with a debate, but he's uh, he just saw uh, fought yesterday. He's real big in the MMA stuff. Uh, he's oh, got okay. his podcast started. I got to get him uh, hooked up with you. Yeah, definitely, man. Absolutely. And listen, and and you know, I'm uh, I'm ever I'm grateful for guys like you that come around and like, yeah, let's help this young guy out because you know when I first started, I'm not going to mention any names, but I wanted to interview this one guy who has a huge podcast. And uh, he shit all over me, basically. And I actually kept the message because I'm like, ah, one day I'm going to fucking show it to this guy. <laughs> then, you know, not only in this business, but in life in general, you have to have that drive. Yes. Life owes you nothing. And having the attitude you have and the drive that you have, that's usually what makes people successful in this business. Yeah. And, you, and like... You know, like like somebody like you who 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 helped me out having me on your show, Danny D. Lowe and having him come on mine, and Larry Mazza coming on mine, and and uh, Johnny Alight and Michael Dowd that helped me come on, that let me go on their show for free, and so on and so forth. Um, you, you got to give back. So when Muscular Development contacted me, I told them, yeah, I'll definitely do it. But one thing, I got to bring my partner, Jason Owens. And because he's been and he goes, yeah, no problem. Have whoever you want. And I wouldn't do it without him because the guy has been on that that roundtable discussion since day one, you know, and. Uh, and he has a supplement line and, you know, so it, it you got to help if you, if, you know, Patrick, but David says basically like if you're around people and they're not successful and they're not making money you're not helping them be successful and helping them make money you're not going to be successful and help them make money and i truly believe that that's a damn good saying yeah now uh you ride don't you yes i can't wait actually i got the guy emailed me yesterday and said it's almost ready i can't fucking wait i totally customized i got a 2015 
breakout. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I got a uh, a chain. I I got a custom um, uh, sissy bar. I I uh, I uh, got the uh, customized paint. Um, I blacked the whole thing out. Um, I I put a uh, I'm putting an all in this. Uh, you know, air intake, the, you know, the wide ones I'm getting it tuned and I got the Derby cover. I actually got, I don't know if you saw it. I put it on my Instagram. I actually got my, a, a Derby cover with my logo from the podcast on the half, the half <laughs> court chest, the half gladiator. Yeah. I can't wait to get it back dude. But the thing is, you know, it's getting cold now in another, you know, couple of weeks, it's time to put the bike away, you know, right. only lunatic. What, got, what uh, drew you to the breakout? Oh well, you know what it is? I'm not a big fan of um of baggers and uh a lot of people love baggers. I'm not a big fan of it and the breakout is more of like a sporty looking. You know, it has the big tire and you know, and I always like it either with the drag bars or the or the uh uh what was it? The ape hangers. Mm. And, and uh to me it always looked like I I always liked Harleys that had that that sporty look, but had that typical old school Harley look. Right. And I felt like the breakout, you could kind of combine both. You Willie know? says uh, he has a 2019 breakout. You'll love it unless you're traveling. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 My brother, my oldest brother has a bagger and all his friends have baggers and he wants me to go to Pennsylvania and Connecticut. And I'm like, dude, I, you know, I'll, I'll come. I'm going to freeze my balls off. Like, it's not, <laughs> you know, try a breakout East, uh, West Coast, man. Your ass be hurting a little bit. Oh, that's another thing I did, actually. I ordered a, uh, a new seat from, uh, Saddleman, yeah, Saddleman, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's guy. I, I really can't wait. I'm spending some money, but spending the money customized the bike was more was less money than actually buying a new bike. So, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what do you like about uh, you know what got you into riding? What got you into motorcycling? Well, I always I always liked it. When I was a kid, I had uh, you know I had you know the Japanese bikes, and my oldest brother was always into bikes, and he was always in different clubs and whatnot, and um. You know, I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm married now. I don't, we don't have kids. We don't have money problems. I'm going to go get the bike that I want, you know. And uh, I just always liked that. You know, when I lived in Brooklyn, uh, the famous biker was Indian Larry. God bless oh, his yeah. soul. You know, he had, what was it, uh, Grease Monkey or something like that. His garage was called. And, um, you know, he was, the, he was the, you know, the the big name in Brooklyn and, um you know, then, you know, you also had, uh, you know, uh, the angels had their, 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 um, headquarters on uh, third street in, in New York city. So they were always all over the place. And there was plenty of bike clubs in Staten Island. When I moved to Staten Island, you had the bridge runners and the, uh, uh, I forgot. Oh, uh, the 69ers. And they were always all over the place. And like my brother was always, he, my brother was in a club called, um, the Islanders cause they were from Staten Island and, and I just like kind of loved it. I always loved most. And I, I love like the engine and the, the, you know, just, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, I like muscle cars too. When I was a kid, my neighbor's name was this, this is how much things have changed. Right. My neighbor had a, uh, a super gas car, right. It was a 67 firebird or something like that. Mm-hmm. And every Sunday he would put it on a trailer and he would, and he would uh, take it to English town and race. It was him and his brother. Man, he used to start this thing up, and I was a kid, and he used to start this thing up, and the whole neighborhood would, would fucking hear it, right? And it was like 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I would run to the window and watch him pull the car into the trailer. And, and I remember one time he was, he was in the car pulling it into the trailer, and his brother was like, you know, guiding him in or whatever. And his wife comes out. His wife's name was Debbie. And Debbie, she's like, and his name was Louie. And uh, Debbie was like, Louie, the neighbors, you're going to wake all the neighbors. And, and Louie just looks at her and goes, babe, go back in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Lori Bell says you're cute. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, thank What's you your much. audience demographics? Is it oh, most so. male or female? Yeah, I just looked at it the other day. I'm like 90% good dudes. <laughs> because all my content, even when I do, like, I even talk, I even talk a lot about men's um, I even talk a lot about men's issues that we don't talk about, you know, like, um, you know, uh, men are three to five times more likely to self-delete. I know you can't say that word on, uh, right. um, you know, 
um, the fact that you know, uh, men, you know, men aren't they're getting killed in divorce court ninety five percent of the times, and nobody gives a shit. Um, you know, you just go down the list. Uh, the fact that you know these blue collar workers, guys like me, that get no respect whatsoever, and it's like you know, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't have lights or power or running water. You know, and uh, you know. And these girls, they're being brought up to, you know, I don't need no man. Screw you, you know. Uh, and it's just, you know, and I talk a lot about that. So, of course, guys are going to watch that. And I've actually lost for some friends that I knew from high school because they got a, the girls get offended. And I knew there were two girls from high school and they watched my channel. Like, yeah, I'll watch it. And I'm talking about how the majority of girls are the ones filing for divorce, like 70 to 80 percent. You know, mm. and if they're if they're college educated, it actually goes up to ninety percent of of women that file. Like so, it's fifty percent divorce, but the majority of them are filed by women. You know, and uh, and and when I say these things, these girls get they get mad and they're like, "I don't agree with you." And I'm like, "Okay, I'm just, I'm just giving you the stats. I don't know what you want me to say." You know, and then they they un, they unfollow and or they curse me out or whatever. You know, <laughs> one girl really got mad at me. I've known her since I'm a kid, and she deleted me off Facebook and Instagram because I said, you know, I said the value of a woman is, is her value is highest when she's young because she's young, she's beautiful, she's able to have children, so on and so forth, right? And as she gets older, her looks go down and she's not able to conceive as, as well as she was when she was younger. So her value goes down. But if I said, if they play it right, if they have a family, then a woman's value is holding the family together. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's not happening anymore. Right. So a, a man's value goes up when he gets older because he, he gets, he gets, you know, he has resources, he has money put away, he has a home, he has cars, he has, you know, especially if you keep yourself in shape, when you're a kid, you got nothing. You ain't got a pot to piss in. Right. Most most men that are self, uh, that are millionaires and billionaires are self made. Uh, most women that are, are millionaires and billionaires are either from a divorce settlement or uh, or they get it from their family, right? And I'm saying these things, and this girl fucking freaked like like this whole thing she cursed me out. Her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So unfriended <laughs> me on on Facebook and Instagram, and never spoke to me again. I've known this girl since. Might even been might even been middle school. I might have known her since I was like fourteen or something like that, and that was it because that that was it done. Do you? Know? You, it, it, you know what? I get the same thing when you're trying to be honest, no filter and stuff during your show. You'll get these people that get whacked on you, man. Oh, yeah, they're whacked, yeah. and as you grow, you're gonna get it even more. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I I get it here and there. I'm sure you get it a lot more than I do. I get it here and there. But some of them, some of them are really vicious. Like I, you know, some of them, like I had this one person, I don't know who it is because when you click it on YouTube, it's this anonymous account, you know, like just you, you, you suck. You don't know how to interview. Uh, you'll never make it. You don't know what you're doing. And, and, and I'm like, well, apparently you're watching it because you're watching it and you're commenting, you know, and this person did it a few times. And I was like, I, I you know. Right. I don't know what to tell you. You're watching it, and thanks for the view and, and the comment. I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I get By the way, this is John with serious and silliness. Make sure you guys and gals get over there and subscribe to him, man. He's gives some of the best damn interviews uh, on YouTube right now. You got the final thoughts, man. Me? Oh shit! Well, I want to thank you, man, and and people like you to help me out because. Um, I mean, I know it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work, but when you come across somebody like yourself and I named some others earlier that go out of their way to help a guy that, uh, is not at their level yet, it means a lot to me, dude. It really does. And because you're going to be co-hosting some shows with me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Uh, uh, again, with Anthony Ruggiano, um, and we'll see if we can get some other guys, other guys on too, that I've, that I've interviewed, you know, who would come on Rita? Rita would definitely do it. The daughter of Vin, Vin, <laughs> the daughter of Vinny, the chin. Cause her and I, her and I actually became really friendly since that last one. And, um, yeah, she's got some crazy, she's got some, her father was like, like, Oh man, like her stories are crazy. Like her father didn't use the phone for 40 years, 40 years, 40 man. years. They used to talk, uh, they, <laughs> Ace man, yeah, he didn't use the phone for. He said, she said the only time he ever used the phone was when he was in prison, 
and it was uh, and he had a call home, and he and she said that you weren't allowed to speak his name. So if you were going to go meet him, you couldn't say his name. You just pointed to your chin. <laughs> That's how secretive he was, and he wouldn't leave. He wouldn't leave the house. He he lived with his grand with his mother, but that was by design. He had he had this huge home in in New Jersey for his wife and his family. And then I believe he had an apartment for his mistress and, and his family with them, you know? Um, but he would, he stayed in, in Greenwich village with his grandmother till the day that, you know, he went to prison and, and that was by design. He would not leave the house in during the daylight. He would only leave at night if he had to do something, if he had to meet somebody, so on and so forth. And he wouldn't. He would only go to meetings if it was absolutely one hundred percent necessary. That was it, you know. But anyway, dude, I just want to say, you know, I, I, I it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to thank you, man, and I'm glad this is working out because I love doing it. I love speaking to people like you. I love, I love interviewing people. You know, um, I'm just glad it's really working. I mean, you know, the whole thing it started off with just like. COVID and like, I'm just going to talk into a microphone and then it just, it just kind of snowballs, you know, it just gets better and better. And I'm just hoping that it just keeps growing, man. That's really well, it. Got the right attitude, man. You'll get it up there. Thank Again, you. this is John with serious and silliness. You know, we uh, appreciate him having them on the show and all that good stuff. Again, get on over there, man, and uh, check them out. Really good uh, material over there. It's a lot of, uh, different type of subjects you'll really get into it because i'm a binge watcher of his now <laughs> so uh, i just watch and watch now you send me them and i'm watching them uh it, it's rare that you can get that out of a creator on youtube where you just want to watch all their stuff all the time but uh congrats on your uh new venture man that kicks ass man i'm real happy for you thank you so much man. it means a lot thank you very much Thanks, man. Don't forget to join uh, me tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Mooch and Black Dragon's going to be on. We're going to be talking about the Little Dave and the Mongols uh, case, or, you know, United States of uh, the Mongols. We're going to be talking about that one. Rock on. Rock on.